Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you all for coming and being here this morning. It is a uh, privilege to be able to stand before you today and deliver this teaching. Um, it's been a long time since I stood here, so uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity. And uh, I missed y'all too. But uh, since it's been a long time, <clears throat> I just thought maybe I'd write a book. I was told a couple of times coming in that they know publishers that would probably could make a book out of that, but I'm not telling any names uh, who said that, but his name's Josh. Oh. <laughs> We're going to do a few things a little different today. Those of you that know my teaching style, usually I'm uh, more of a connect the dots kind of guy that's uh, running you through the Torah and all the different uh, prophets and New Testament. Today we're not going to do that. We're going to do something a little different. Um, today we're going to be talking about Elijah. Who was he? Where did he come from? We're going to look at some of the events in his life. What kind of man that he was what characteristics that he had. And hopefully, once we look at all of them, we'll be able to put those characteristics into our own lives and live like Elijah did. So, how long do I have? Y'all remember that. <laughs> so who was he? It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according unto my word. That's in 1 Kings 17 is where we're going to start. If you guys want to follow along, you can. We're going to be in 1 Kings 17 most of the day. We'll be flipping back and forth. Um, something stands out here. So we see Elijah. Does anybody know what Elijah means? Anyone? Nobody? Elijah means God of Jehovah. Elijah. He's the name of a famous prophet and two other Israelites. Elijah. So we could say Yahweh is his God. So right away we see that in his name alone we can see immediately who he is. We know he was a man of God. He was also a Tishbite. Anybody know what a Tishbite is? Tishbite comes from the Hebrew 8664. Tishbite. Partially from an unused name, meaning recourse. A Tishbite or an inhabitant of Tishba. It's in the Galilee area. It means recourse. So here's a man of God who Yahweh is his is his God, and he's from recourse. Tishbat is not in Israel, guys. It's on the other side of the Jordan. Just thought I'd share that with you for a second. Let that marinate. And also it says here that he is, was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Does that mean that he was from Gilead? Does that mean that he lived in Gilead? What does the word inhabitants mean? We think it means that he just lives there, right? The Hebrew word there is tashab. Tashab comes from the Hebrew root word, 3427. It means a dweller, but not outlandish, especially as a distinguished from a native citizen, active participant, a temporary inmate, or more lodger, lodger, Resident alien, foreigner, inhabitants, sojourner, stranger. Hmm. Now there's 14 times in the, in the word where this word is actually used. Toshab. It's used 14 different times. Let's look at what it's, some of those instances. Let's go to Genesis 23. Whoop, I'm already there. Huh. It says, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. And these were the years of Sarah's life. And Sarah died in Kirjabartha, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger 
and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may go and bury my dead out of my sight. He said he was a stranger and a sojourner. It's the same word there, same Hebrew word, Teshav. This shows that Elijah was not from Gilead or any part of it, but perhaps the text itself, excuse me, the text, is hinting at something else. Not just that he didn't live there, or that he was a stranger in that land. Perhaps it implies that he is not an inhabitant of earthly things. Leviticus 27 says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. The Hebrew word there for holy is kadosh. It means sacred, ceremonially or morally. As a noun, God, by eminence, an angel, a saint, a sanctuary, holy one, or a saint. Hmm. God told us that we should be holy, for he is holy, right? Holy can mean to be separate, can be, be set apart as well. Let's go to Hebrews 11. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. There's that word again, strangers. Elijah was a stranger in this land. We should be also. We shouldn't see ourselves as the land around us as being ours. It's not our home. And we get involved in things sometimes. We talk about, well, you know, I don't like this and I don't like that. And they shouldn't be this and they shouldn't be that. It's not your land. You might be a citizen of the United States of America, folks, but you're, this is not your land. If you recall yourself one of God's chosen people, this is not your land. So let's remember that when we get sidetracked in the Trump discussions and the what's going on next and the immigration and all the other things that are out there to distract you away from what you should be doing, which is seeking the kingdom. Hebrews 11 goes on to say, For they that say such things declare plainly, that they seek a country. Ah, here we go. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned to it. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. These particular people here that we're talking about, they desire a better country and it's heavenly. Their homes are, they're the kingdom. They're kingdom-minded people. They're not concerned about borders. They're not concerned about any of these things. One thing, kingdom. Let's go back to our story. Then Elijah the Tishbite, who was an inhabitant of Galilee, said unto Ahab, okay, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain three years, but according to my word. The Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand. So we can see here what a faithful man that he actually was. His very first act that we're introduced to him, the very first time he shows up, he's going before a king to say that there's, not, there's going to be a drought. Okay. Now, for those of you that are sitting here thinking, well, that's no big deal. Well, let me put it in terms that you might be understand. It would be like you going to the governor of this state of Texas and saying, you're not going to get any more oil anymore. No more oil. Think he'd laugh at you? Probably so. Same thing here. They all laughed at him, right? We see in the next verses some examples of his obedience. 
Moving on in verse 2 and 3, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kareth. That is the fourth Jordan. Anybody have any idea what that brook, that name there means? You think maybe it's a coincidence that he went down there, that he was told to go down there? Let's look it up. Hebrew word is 3747, is kareth. It means a cut. So we're just talking about being set apart. And he's going to a river now that literally means cut or a brook. Hmm. Let's move on in our story. And it shall be that, I, that thou shalt drink of the brook that I have commanded thee, and the ravens to feed thee there. <clears throat> so he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Gareth. That is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning. And bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. Hmm. So here... God tells him that he'll be fed by ravens by the brook to go down to this brook, right? You notice Elijah doesn't even question it? Did you notice that? He doesn't even say, but the ravens are unclean birds, Lord, and I'm a vegetarian. No. He just goes. Shows the amount of faith that he had in the Lord, right? So I wonder... How much easier would it be in our lives if we could trust the Lord the same way Elijah did? If God told you, I want you to get in your truck and drive down to Pecos down here, and I want you to live on the Pecos River, and I'll send some ravens to take care of you, and uh, that everything will be fine. Would you do it? I'm pretty sure at least you'd say, uh, wait a minute, what about my home? What about my family or what you know what kind of is that GMO or non-GMO I mean, hmm. moving on and the word of the Lord came unto him saying arise get thee to Zarephath which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there behold I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Guys, I realize y'all know this story very well. Um, and I realize that I'm probably preaching to the choir, but once again, we're going to look at the character of the man. And through this study, we're going to find a few things out about ourselves. So let me ask you this. Why here? Why did he go to Zarephath? Why did he sit him there? For all of you guys watching on camera, there is a bunch of people in here that's being really quiet. <laughs> so, um, what does Zarephath mean? Anybody know? That's right. According to the Strong's, Zarephath means refinement. Refinement. Hmm. So, he sent him there for refinement. That's the reason why he sent him there. What is refinement? And what does it mean to be refined? Let's go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1 says that the trials of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Yeshua. The trial of your faith trial of your faith is your refining fire. Elijah is going to be tried here. He's going to be smeltered into a fine piece of gold. We need to recognize this in our own lives. The trials and troubles come to everyone equally. No one is too holy or too, or too bad to not re go through the trials. Do you realize that? This is Elijah here. 
he's going to be refined, going through trials and troubles. See, God has a purpose for these things in our lives. Do we recognize that? Do we recognize that? Or do we just complain about it? Do we just complain? Yeah, we complain a lot. Or at least I do sometimes. There you go. So, he says, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. It belongeth to Zidon. Zidon is where he sent him for this to uh, go seek out this little woman. Does any of this sound remotely familiar to you? Zidon. He goes to the zone and eventually heals a sick child. It really, really sounds familiar. So, you do a little checking, and sure enough, it is familiar. Mark, chapter 7. Here we see who? The Messiah. And from hence he arose, and he went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man known it. But he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had, been, had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophian, I killed that thing, by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Yeshua said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, go thy way. The devil has gone out of thy daughter. And when she hath come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. Here we see Elijah as a type of Yeshua. They went to the exact same place. They both met a woman, and both of them actually healed this woman's child. Do you see what, we're, what he's saying here? Do you see the parallel? Hmm. I thought that was totally cool. So. <laughs> okay. So, it says that going on with our story, so he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in thy vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of the bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, there's that term again, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal, in a barrel, and a little oil, and a cruse. And behold, I am gathering sticks, that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we, we may eat it and die. So let's recap for a second. So Elijah is told by Yahweh to go to Zarephath, a place of refinement. Find a widow woman. She'll sustain you. And when he gets there, he finds out that she's dirt poor. Not only is she dirt poor, but she, there's no way she can eat anything. She's ready to die. She's so poor. And so I ask you, what do you do next if you're Elijah? What do you do? Do you say, really? Really, Lord? What do you do? Let me ask you this. Would you still have faith to ask her? That'd be, that'd be pretty tough, I think. You know, Very few of us, we're all pretty blessed to know where our next meal's coming from. And if you've ever been to you met out for lunch, you know we eat very well here. <laughs> very few of us know the struggle, what that's like, to not know where your next meal's coming from. But there are many people around the world that that struggle is real every day. 
every day. And how would we feel if we took a last meal off of one of those people? Just think about it for a minute. Could you do it? This is a trial. I'd have to tell you that I would probably not do it. I would have a hard time even asking. But then again, the Lord told me to do it. So now what? You know, we read the story, we know that he goes on and he does ask her. See, it's not that Elijah was actually selfish. He was commanded by God to actually ask the widow for food, and he did it. Once again, showing great faith and obedience to ask the woman to sacrifice herself and her son for him. So it wasn't just taking her last meal. If he takes that meal, her and her son die. So you might ask, man, you know, got to be kidding me. Let's... So we read on, though, that Yahweh always has a plan, right? So then Elijah said to her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the days of the Lord send rain upon the earth. Now, if you were this widow woman right now, you'd probably be saying, are you nuts? Did you not hear what I just said to you? I don't have any. I'm not going to make you a cake. I don't even have enough to make, you know, a little bite. But she didn't, did she? See, we see here that Elijah, once again, being the type of the Messiah, because the Messiah provides you with eternal life. Elijah is going to provide this widow with actual physical life therefore showing to her that I can provide you this bread but there is another bread that's even more than this anybody following me but in order to inherit that actual eternal life we have to do exactly like the widow woman did she was willing to give it all not only did she give her bread and her oil, she gave everything. She showed total trust in the prophet of God and in God himself that he would not forsake her. Because by doing what she did, there's no recourse. If Elijah was a liar or a false prophet, she's going to die. She was willing to lay down her life So, we've talked so far about Elijah being obedient to, to Yahweh. But here we see the widow being obedient to Elijah. He must have been of trustworthy character. After all, she didn't know him from Adam. The widow could tell that God was at the forefront of all that he did. I wonder if we were to meet somebody in the world, have a short conversation with them, would they be able to tell these same things about us? just from our appearance, just from speaking with us for a few minutes. Hmm. Hmm. Going on with our story, back to 1 Kings. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither the crucible failed according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no bread left in him. No breath, excuse me. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sins to remembrance and to slay my son? Wow, how quickly they forgot. How quickly do we turn? See, 
what she doesn't realize here is that this is another test of her faith, another trial. But like so many of us at this point right here, what does she do? She turns and blames the prophet, blames God. I can tell you I've done it. You know, he's been feeding her for two years out of a bucket. A, a little, have you ever seen a cruise, what that looks like? It's about this big. That's her oil. A bucket of flour this big. It's a vase. That's it. For two years, they've been eating out of that. Nobody's went to the store. It just magically appears. And then this happens here. First thing that she does is what? Oh, my God. You know? But once again, we see Elijah separating himself from the world. He's actually being called here a man of God, and we're going to do a little bit on that word study here in just a moment. Let's go and explore some of the other places that we can find where someone is called the man of God, and let's make some comparisons. Let's see if this is just Elijah. Deuteronomy 33, 1 says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. 1 Samuel 9, 6. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is a city and a man of God, and he is an honorable man. And all that is saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go hither, for adventure he can show us our way that we should go. We read also in Nehemiah. It says, And the chief of the Levites, Hashbiah, Shivriah, and Jeshua, hmm, and the son Kadiamo, with their brethren over against them to praise and to give thanks according to the commandments of David, the man of God. Ward over against words. And he goes on again in verse 36. And his brethren, Shemiel, and Azareel, Mikael, Gilali, Mali, uh, yeah, 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 with the musicians of instruments, and David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe before them. I know some of these I, I'm not pronouncing very well. I've had a horrible cold this week, so I'm having a hard time with my Hebrew tongue, so excuse me. <laughs> so here we see it. David was called a man of God. But wait a minute. He had some problems, didn't he? Samuel, the prophet, was called a man of God. Moses was called the man of God. So, if someone, let's say someone forgot your name. Man, I can't remember their name. And they're trying to tell someone else about you. How would they describe you? Would they say, oh man, what's his name? You know the guy that drives the big truck? That guy. Because you like big trucks. Or maybe they'd say, no, no, you know the guy that's the guy that likes to hunt, that guy, what, what's his name? Because he's, maybe he likes to hunt a lot. Maybe that's the only thing they talk about. So that's how they know them. Or will they say, no, 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 no. You know, the real religious one, that one, that nut, that guy. Will they say that? And then everybody knows who they're talking about. What do people see? What do people see us doing in this world? around us will they see God in you will they or will they just see what you do who you, what you like to do where you work that's usually the first thing someone asks you when they come up to you hey what's your name oh, I'm Rodney how you doing what do you do for a living and they identify you by what you do or what you drive what you wear Moving on in our story, he says, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. So how did he raise the child from the dead? He prayed. He prayed. Now, 
he didn't go and call the ambulance. He didn't uh, do CPR. He laid himself on the child three times and prayed to God. Hmm. Once again, faith. Hebrews 11. So what shall I more say? For the time should fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, or excuse me, Jephthah, of David also, of Samuel, and of the prophets, whom through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed villain, valiant and valiant in battle and fight, I'm sorry. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. These are all men of God. In each one of them, we've studied our whole life as children growing up and heard all the stories, right? There's a reason why they teach these stories to little children. It's not just for entertainment. It's to show them the character of the men and women that we're supposed to be. Elijah subdued kingdoms. He subdued a kingdom with a drought. And as we read, raised the dead through faith and prayer. Back to our story in 1 Kings. If you're following along, you might want to just keep your finger on that or put a mark there or something. And it came to pass that for many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Of course, what did he do? He went and showed himself to Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab calls Obadiah, which was the governor of his house, and it says here that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so so it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto the fountains of water, and unto all the brooks, preadventure that you may find grass to save the horses and mules alive. That we lose not the beast. So they divided the land between them and passed through it. And Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went the other way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? How did Obadiah know him? Nowhere in Scripture do you ever see that Obadiah had ever met him before in his life. So how did he know who he was? Once again, we see Elijah's faith and obedience to God going before Ahab. You know, this is the same man that we're told in chapter 17. He'd already told him, for three years, you ain't getting no rain. And now they're out scouring, looking for grass. But he did, I just told him to go before Ahab. You think maybe you might have said, God, you sure about that? You sure that's where you want me to go? He's going to be pretty mad. Nope, didn't say a word, did he? You can see the impact of the famine that's on the land. and They're out looking for grass as far as they can go. The kingdom was in shambles here, and as far as Ahab was concerned, it was Elijah's fault. You know, you can learn something from Ahab, too. Did Ahab blame himself? No. Did he blame his religious beliefs? Or his God? No. He blamed a man. He blamed Elijah. Let's read on and see how it turns out. Second King, or yeah, Second Kings one says, and he said unto them, What manner of man? 
What manner of man is this which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man and girded with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah was instantly recognizable, not only by his behavior, but also by his clothing. He looked different than everyone else around him. Once again, set apart, separate. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go out and, you know, buy leather girdles and start wearing them. But, you know, we should be different than the world around us, both in appearance and in our lifestyle. People should be able to see us and know immediately that that person's different. And he goes on to say, And Elijah answered him, I am. Go tell the Lord, behold, Elijah is here. <laughs> and Obadiah said, Are you crazy? You see if y'all are paying attention. He said, Are you nuts? Well, what have I done to deserve this? What sin have I committed to deserve all these things? You know, he says, you know, Ahaz's been looking for you high and low for three years, dude. Everybody goes looking for you. He makes me swear an oath. says, we didn't find him. I swore that oath. Now, if I go back now and say, I found him, what do you think's going to happen? I'm going to cut my head off. Well, I said, that's all right. Just go down there and tell him anyway. He said, well, did, didn't you hear what I did while you were gone? I, I took, and when Jezebel was coming after you, she slew all the prophets. I took 100 men of the Lord's prophets by 50 and put them in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now thou sayest, go and tell the Lord, behold, Elijah's here. He's going to kill me. No, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Some friend, huh? Some friend. But there's an important phrase there. As the Lord thy God liveth. And we've been hearing this over and over and over as they've actually been talking to one another and swearing by the Lord thy God that liveth. I mentioned Obadiah with him because he spends, what, three times he's trying to talk Elijah out of his idea. Elijah's mind was made up. The Lord told him to do it. He's going to go do it. Even after Obadiah paints that beautiful picture, he still goes. Hmm. About 20 minutes. On with our story. It says, and Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. That was his answer. He was not swayed. And now comes the show down at high noon. For those of you that love westerns, this is probably one of your favorite stories. Like the OK Corral, the, or the sheriff and the rifleman, they come out in the street and they stand off and draw. That's what we're about to see. We all know the story of the prophet of Baal, all the prophets, what they did, right? And we know ultimately what the outcome was, right? Did you see this, though? It says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? We all have heard that, right? We've all heard that. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. They were totally quiet. And again, we see, and they took, later on, as they're preparing the bulls, they took the bullocks, which was given unto them. They dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal. From morning until evening, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Anybody see anything here? I want to show you something interesting. That word right there, halt, is the exact same word here as leaped. It's Pesach. Pesach. 
When I saw that, I about fell out of my chair. And I said, you know, what more fitting thing than at this time of the year to find this little nugget here? Does anybody know what it means for Pesach? Figuratively, to skip over, to hop, to spare, by implication, to hesitate. Also, literally, to limp, to dance, to halt, become lame, leap, or pass over. Wow. Looks like the prophets of Baal were doing a little mixing, didn't it? Okay, we got about 15 minutes. Got two more sections to do here, but I want to get through this one for sure. So, is everybody ready? Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. There they stood, one against 450. See, it sounds like a Western movie to me. Elijah felt like he was completely alone here. Have you ever felt alone in your walk? Let's be honest. Yep. Hmm? Yeah. Did you know that he wasn't the only one that felt this way in the Word? A lot of the prophets felt this way. Let's take a look at a few of them and let's see how Yahweh was there for each and every one of them. And it came to pass. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to see the first time that we see this filling alone. And it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the Son of God saw that the daughters of men were fair. And they took them wives, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that which he is also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, and the same became mighty men, which were the old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of that. Of, excuse me. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and he grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and everything that creepeth, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I had ever made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You can see here pretty quickly that Noah also felt completely alone. Depending on who you talk to, he built a boat for a hundred years. How many people do you think he told about what was going to happen? Probably everybody that came around, right? For a hundred years, I'm pretty sure he told at least one person. How many people made it on the ark? just him and his family and according to the word he was the only one that was righteous you don't think he felt alone totally alone he and his whole family were the only ones faithful eight people out of what billion million don't know how many people on the earth back then it was quite a few Eight people. I'm sorry, but I would feel very much alone in that boat for floating on the water by myself. And it would probably stink too, but hey. And it goes on. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood upon the waters of the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein there is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. It says, And God remembered Noah. And everything, every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over 
the earth, and the water abated. Passover. Hmm. They weren't alone. God was with them the whole time. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel 3. So then and a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and language, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psalteries, the dulcimers, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar, the king hath set up. And we skip down to verse 12, and it says, And there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Wow. Only three men in the entire nation? The only three? You sure you're feeling alone? Of course, we all know the story and what happens to him, right? It says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, and he said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were followed in the fire, but Yahweh was with them in the fire, wasn't he? See, they had to go through a fire, a refining fire, if you will. But what they knew was what? That God would be with them. That's something you need to remember every time you're having a trial or trouble in your life, that you're not alone. You may feel like it, but you're not. There's an old saying in the military that says, there are no atheists in a foxhole. When the bullets start flying away and it's just you in the foxhole, trust me, you're not an atheist anymore. But that's where it comes from, because you're being tried. And what you need to realize is that the Lord is sitting right beside you, just waiting for you to make the right choice. You know, you, you hear this term godiness, right? Everybody hear that? Oh, that's so godly. You've heard that, right? Where do you think it comes from? It comes from events like this, when God shows up in a furnace and it blazes up and these guys are walk out untouched. And they talk, they're still talking about it. That's Gotti. It's because God likes to show off. He's the ultimate superhero, right? He loves to show off. He loves to dote on his children. I mean, how many of you have set things before your children and you want them to choose one or the other because you got a real special something for them? When they choose the wrong thing, then what? Well, I've got to take that gift back to the store. Or maybe I'll do something different. The point is, is that when you're walking through these trials and you feel alone, you need to remember these stories that you're not alone. I'm going to go back to Kings now. But we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 6, 15 through 17. When the servant and the man of God has risen earlier and gone forth, behold, a host encompassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for thou, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Here we see Elijah's successor, Elisha, talking to a servant. The servant felt totally alone and helpless <clears throat> against the numbers of the army until God showed him through Elijah his presence. How many times have you felt the load and prayed for your eyes to be open? You know, it's easy to sit here <clears throat> with people of like faith and say, no, I don't feel alone. I got all of you, right? But what about next week? Next Wednesday when you're working, you find yourself surrounded like Elijah did by people who don't believe the truth. 
They don't believe the way you do. And in many cases may even ridicule you, come against you. You want your eyes open then? But as we have seen here, God always, he's always around us, right? He's always around us. Our brothers and our sisters in the Lord are just simply a phone call away. Being lonely can really bring you down. As I'm sure from time to time it also brought these men down. We must not let this happen. We have to hold fast to the hope that is in you. And remember that Yahweh is with us at all times. No matter the trial, he's always there. He'll never leave you and never forsake you. I preach it to myself as much as I am y'all. Like I said, I feel a little something different today. Let's see, for time's sake here, I'm going to paraphrase some of these things. In 2 Kings 18, 23, we see the challenges laid down. Whoever calls fire down from heaven will be the true God. Now, on the surface, this seems brave, right? Pretty brave. Yeah, we're going to do this thing and call fire down. Yeah. Seems pretty brave. But then again, you know, what makes it even braver is that uh, had it not have come down, Elijah would have been killed. See, there was never an if for Elijah if it came down. He knew it would. Why? Because he trusted. There wasn't, it wasn't bravery. It wasn't courage. There was only faith and trust in the one true God to answer his prayer. He prayed and he believed. That simple. It goes on to show how Elijah's confidence grew as he mocked the prophets of Baal. Now, I'm not advocating that you go around mocking people to mock the pagans or, or the fact that they don't believe or the things that they believe or even fellow believers. No, no, Lord, no. We should have the confidence in Yahweh to answer our prayers as we encounter these people on the earth. You don't have that confidence? You need to get that with because God's listening. He's there. Let's move on to our story. We know the story. They go on, they dig the trench, they pour water on it. He mocks them, says, you know, maybe he's not listening to you, maybe he's asleep. Everyone knows the story? Now, we see here something else going on. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3 says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This is after the showdown. And with all, and with all he had slain of all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by morrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose, and he went for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Now someone else wants to kill him. Not only is it the king don't like him, now the king's wife wants to kill him too. So here we see Elijah, right after calling down fire from heaven, his faith starts to lack. He just called fire down from heaven. And he's afraid of one woman. 450 men just got killed. Now one woman. I'm going to submit to you that it wasn't just one little woman. I might also notice that this is the very first time that, that he went somewhere without God telling him to. The very first time you ever see it. Every other time you went somewhere, God told him. This is the first time he went somewhere on his own. He's making his own decisions now. He didn't ask God. He didn't listen to God. He's making his own choices. And can you blame him? I mean, it's easy to judge him. 
But, you know, here's Jezebel. And according to the word, she's the most evil woman that ever lived. She's after him. And yes, he should have trusted in God, but he still has flesh, right? He's still a flesh. His first instinct was to save himself rather than to let God do it for him. You know, we have the benefit of reading these stories and looking back and going, well, what happened? You know, we say the same things when you read the story about the Israelites sitting at Mount Sinai. And God speaks from the mountain and all that. It's like, wow, man, you see all these miracles. He's part of all the waters. He's done all the things, brought you out of Egypt. And then what? Moses disappears for 40 days. And what happens? They build a golden calf, start off. And you think, why in the world would you do that for? You just saw all these things. Huh? Elijah was fed by ravens. God has took care of him every step of the way. Provided food for a widow. Stopped rain. Called fire down from heaven. And now suddenly, oh man, this one little woman. And he takes off running for his life. Point is, is that these prophets are not super beings. They're just like you and I. So, it says he went a day's journey in the wilderness and came down and set up under a juniper tree. And he requested of himself to die. It had gotten so bad that he wanted to die. He said, it's enough. It's enough. Just let me die. I'm not as good as my father's. I'm not better than them. It's enough. See, he wasn't perfect. But we will see here very quickly how quickly it turns around. Let's read on and see why. And let's see here. First Kings nineteen ten through thirteen. So you've been just end up on the mountain. He reaches the mountain after running for forty days in the desert. He reaches the mountain, he gets up to the top. It says that he went and the Lord passed by him and there's a great strong rent rent the mountain, breaks all the rocks in pieces, but the Lord was not in the wind. Y'all know the story. And after the wind, the earthquake, but the Lord was in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the still, small voice. Does anybody have any idea why this is in Scripture here? Y'all know that this is a bedtime story that's told to every child growing up. Right? Why is that? If you ever think that you're getting a word from the Lord, if it comes like a wild wind, it's not God. If it comes as fire, it's not from God. If it shakes you like an earthquake, it's not from God. If it's a still, small voice speaking from inside of you in your own head, it's from God. You better listen. It says that he wrapped his face in his mantle and all that, and when he came up there, God said what? What are you doing here? So what does Elijah reply? Uh, maybe he didn't hear me. Uh, he repeats the whole thing again. Well, uh, you know, uh, went up there and did whatever she said, called down fire, da 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 and now they want to kill me, and I'll seek my life. What am I going to do? And what does God say? You know, God never addresses those doubts that he had at all, does he? Never once does he say, oh, no, well, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. No, not at all. He just says, I need you to go down and anoint Elijah. Elisha with an S-H. Now, it's hard to imagine how alone that Elijah was actually feeling at this moment. After all, he had just called fire down from heaven, turned Israel back to God. You'd think he'd be on cloud nine, right? How is it he feels so alone that he runs all the way back to the mountain of God? You know, only those people who live in total isolation or live by themselves can really understand this. That feeling that he has right here, right now. Because, you know, the problem with mountain high moments is the low valley moments that follow. And when you have no one beside you to encourage you, to lift you up, to pray with you. Or in this case, anyone to say, hey, 
Did you see what God did? He didn't have nobody to tell it to. It's all by himself. And then just when he's thinking that, it's when this people show up and say, oh, by the way, Jezebel's coming to get you. Caught him at a weak moment, didn't it? There's a bit of emptiness there, right? No one to share the miracle with. I believe that's why God said it's not good for man to be alone. You guys can bear with me a few more minutes. Yes, no. Everybody gets still with me? All right. We're going to talk a little bit about fellowship now and the importance of it. The Lord said unto him, Go and, and return unto thy way in the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazazel king over Syria, and Jehua the son of Nimshi, shalt thou appoint as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Saphat of Abin yeah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazazel shall Judah slay. And he that escapes the sword of Jehua shall Elijah slay, Elisha. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knee which is not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth that is not kissed him. Elijah wasn't alone. He wasn't alone at all. So, Yahweh sends Elijah to help Elijah, and he reassures Elijah that he's not alone at all. You know, it's real easy for us to fall into that trap, thinking that we're alone. Elijah, Elijah had no idea there were 7,000 prophets left. Had no clue. He just got finished telling God twice that he was the only one. There were people there. He just didn't reach out to any of them. He went off, ran off, and got by himself. Got scared. By himself. You know, when you're going through a trial and a trouble, being by yourself is about the worst thing you could possibly do. And that's our human nature is that we want to run away and hide. But in actual reality, that's the worst thing you can do. Because you have no one else, no other voice but the one in your head that's going to reaffirm everything that you're thinking for you. So you're going to become your own second witness. Before too long, you're going to condemn yourself to hell and anything else. Don't be alone. Reach out to those people that are around you. They're there. So, so he goes to anoint Elijah, right? Elijah's plowing with 12 yokes of oxen. found that very interesting. Elijah passed him, and he cast his mantle upon him. And we know what happened after that. He goes back and kisses his mother and father, slays the oxen, gives it all to the people, and he follows after Elijah. These 12 yokes of oxen would have brought Elijah's mind immediately back to the altar that he had built in chapter 18. Y'all remember that altar? What was it made out of? 12 stones. So seeing this 12 yoke, who plows with 12 yokes of oxen, really? I mean, have you ever tried to plow with just two? This guy's got 12 of them, okay? So I look at this guy, and I think, he's got to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, I mean, to control that many oxen. I mean, that's a lot of hor horsepower, pardon the pun. So Elijah immediately seeing these 12 yokes of oxen would have he would have immediately been brought back to that, to that altar and reassured that he's on the right path. Twelve yokes of oxen to plow a land by yourself? Mm -mm. That's not a coincidence. So, now the Lord tells Elijah, go down and meet Ahab. He's in the vineyard of Naboth. We know where he's at. Why? What did, why was he down there in Naboth's vineyard? Exactly, because he wanted it. He killed someone for it. Yeah, Jezebel did. So, 
Thus saith the Lord. Let's see what God has to say about that. Thou hast killed and also taken possession. Thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thou saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O enemy, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. So right away you see that King Ahab saw him as an enemy, not as a friend. So the next time we see Elijah is in chapter 21. He's told to go back there, to go back to Ahab. He just killed 450 of his prophets. And let's not forget that his wife wanted to kill him too. But God says, go back to Ahab. Okay. Elijah, what did he do? Did he go back? Yeah. He didn't say anything. He didn't say, uh, Lord, did you forget about the fact that his wife wants to kill me and that he don't like me either? No. He said, no problem. Elijah's faith and obedience to Yahweh once again shines through here. Isn't that interesting? The chapter before we just read, Elijah says it's enough. I just want to die. Just get it over with. Just take my life. Take me out of this horrible world. I hate living here. Just take me. I'm done. And then he runs into Elisha, who ministers into his ear. And now suddenly he's ready to, to do what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no problem. Let's go down there. Let's do it. It's amazing what a little godly ministry can do for a brother, right? It's amazing. Goes on to say that he's going to make his house just like Jeroboam's because he's provoked anger. And also that Jezebel Spank said the dogs are going to eat her by the wall of Jezreel. And that uh, Ahab, the dogs are going to eat him in the exact same place where he killed, had uh, Nethboth killed. Right? So, God passes judgment on Ahab. But what is that judgment? He just said he's going to make his house like Jeroboam, right? Well, if you turn to 1 Kings 15, you'll find that Jeroboam's house was totally destroyed. Nothing that had any breath was left. He destroyed him and the entire inhabitants, his entire family. So, the judgment that God passed on Ahab for this was what? Exactly the same. So what does Ahab do? Oh, it says here in chapter 21 of 1 Kings that he ran his clothes, put sackcloth upon his, fa- eh, sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, laid in sackcloth, and went softly. He repented. Wow. <laughs> And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will bring the evil in his days. I will not bring evil in his days. But in his son's days, I will bring the evil upon his house. And that's exactly what happened. Because he humbled himself. So now Ahab has finally come around. What does this tell us about Elijah? What does it tell me? What does it tell us about Elijah? Anybody? Anyone? He was relentless. He didn't stop until Yahweh's will was done. He knew Yahweh's will was for Ahab to be saved. And the reason why he knew it is because God kept sending him to tell him to stop doing what he's doing. He could have very easily wrote him off. Could have very easily said, nope, I'm not going down there. Nope, ain't going to happen. But he continued to follow. He continued appearing before him. He kept talking. Lived himself in hiding so he wouldn't get killed from him and help people along the way. And he never gave up on him. And what happened? Ahab's life was spared. So what does it say about you and I? Have you ever tried to share your faith with someone only to have them reject you? What'd you do then? 
It's tough, isn't it? This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it gets real. What did you do? They reject you. Oh, man, I want to hear all that. I don't law of Moses and all that junk. I like my bacon. I want to eat it. We don't have to do all that. Nail the cross. I don't want to hear it. You're crazy. You're part of a cult. From your own family. What did you do? There you go. Maybe we need to be like Elijah. Continue to walk it out. Continue to show with our everyday lives, not just coming here on Shabbat, but every day in between, who we are and what we are. It's not just a fad. It's not just something we do to be able to get our ticket punched to go to heaven. It's our daily walk. And I guarantee you, eventually, they will humble themselves before God, just like Ahab did. He goes on here to see what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah was, who was that? He's Ahab's son, right? Says that he fell down. Says that he had fell down in the lattice of the upper chamber and that now he's sick. And so who does he go after? He wants him to go see who? Beelzebub, God of Akron. You know what this Isaiah's name actually means? It means Yah has seized. The boy's name literally means Yah has seized him. Well, evidently he didn't seize God, did he? He went right back after Baal. His dad got saved, but I ain't going after that route. He's crazy. He fell off the rocker. I'm going back. My family's always been Baal worshippers. My granddad, my great granddad, my great granddad, great, 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 great. Is it good enough for them? Is it good enough for me? I'm a Baal worshiper. That was his attitude, right? So he falls down, he's sick, and he's going after Beelzebub. There's a lot of interesting things in through here, so. Let me see here. Get ahead of myself. Does anybody know what Beelzebub means? That's right. Ball of the Flies. Anybody ever read that book in school? Lord of the Flies? Did you read that? Did you read, realize you were reading Beelzebub? I didn't. Special deity, Beelzebub, Ball of the Flies. And I saw that as like, man, that explains why they make it required reading in school. Can't read the Word of God. We can read that. <laughs> Okay, so Second Kings, back to the story. Remember when he said, how would I know him? He said, he's a hairy guy, he's girded with leather in his loins. That he's Elijah the Tishbite. And he went up to him and bowed, he sat on the top of the hill, and he spake unto him, the man of God, and the king saith unto him, come down. Here again we see it was easily recognizable by what he actually wore. In this case, he wasn't recognized by what he did, he was recognized by what he wore. So, who is he talking to here? He was a captain of 50, right? They sent two captains of 50 two different times, and then and, uh, told Elijah he needs to come to the king. And what happened? Called fire down and killed them both. Third guy comes along, and he was a little different, wasn't he? Third guy approaches Elijah a little differently. He's like, uh, would you mind coming? I don't want to die. Don't kill me. I'm just doing my job. And God said, what? Yeah, go on down there with him. Once again, no hesitation on Elijah's part. He just killed 100 people. And he's going to walk down the mountain now with a captain and 50 more armed people to be taken to the king. Yeah. I think I would be a little scared. Not Elijah. He's like, no problem. God told me to go do it. That's what I'm going to do. You guys are so quiet today. <laughs> so, and now you see here where Elijah and Elijah part ways. He wants to go down. The Lord says he's going to take up Elijah. 
in a whirlwind. Elijah went to Elisha to Gilead, and he's told to Elijah, just stay right here. Elijah said, nope, I'm not going to stay right here. I'm going where you go. So then he goes down there, right? And then God sends him to Bethel, and he says, why don't you stay here? And Elijah said, nope, I ain't doing that. Where you go, I go. So they went down to Bethel. And while they're in Bethel, some of the prophets came up to Elijah, and what'd they say? You know what's going to happen today? The Lord's going to take Elijah from, from us. And he said, yeah, I know. That's why I won't leave. That's why I want to be here. He keeps trying to drop me off everywhere, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay with him to the very end. Once again, showing that Elijah is a type of Messiah. He's clinging to him. So he goes on and on and on. And like I said, I got another hour here, but we need to, we're going to end this here because we got food, of course, and everybody's hungry. <laughs> got to eat. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with this one thing here. Right here. James chapter 5. It says, Elias, which we all know is another word for Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three and a half years. He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. The earth brought forth their fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, any of you err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. How's it be like Elijah? When the Lord tells us to do it, let's do it. Let's be different than the world around us. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web, www.amethatoraodessa.com. Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.